I've got a special episode for you today as I'm joined by Dr. John D. Martini, who's considered one of the world's leading authorities on human behavior and personal development. In this episode, we talk about how to determine your value system and highest priorities, and why living by these is critical to living a fulfilled life. In our chat about values, we discuss their roles in relationships, your career, and how to push forward in the goals you set yourself. Dr. D. Martini has a comprehensive set of questions he asks to help determine one's values, and you'll be able to hear them in this episode, while also taking a test on his website, which I've linked in the show notes today. Towards the end, Dr. D. Martini gives us an insight into one of his 25 1,000 page journals as he reads passages from there and shows the level of clarity required in all domains of life to push forwards. If you're looking to unlock your potential and live a life of your own choosing, you won't want to miss this episode with Dr. John D. Martini today. First of all, I'd like to ask, what was Dr. John D. Martini like at high, high school? Like, what were you like when you were young? <laughs> uh, well, I didn't finish high school. Okay. But I, um, when I, when I, I left home at 13 and I was a street kid, I attempted to go to junior high for a short period of time, but I left school and I was, um, first in baseball up until 13 and then I was into surfing and I was a street kid and then I went to the beach and I lived surfing so I was a surf kid and at 14 I hitchhiked out to California and I was a surfer on the beaches of California and a street kid there and at 15 I uh, panhandled enough money to make a flight to uh, Hawaii and I lived first under a a bridge, and then in a park bench, under a park bench, and then in a bathroom, and then in an abandoned car, and then finally in a tent uh, in a jungle. And I was a, a surfer. So my teenage years was uh, a non-schooled, non-academic surf adventure and um, street adventure. So that was my starting point as a teenager. And um, had some very wild adventures, crazy, crazy times, fun times, but also challenging times at the time. So how did you uh, transition from your surf years to ultimately what you do now? What was the turning point for you? I uh, was surfing in Hawaii. Um, I moved there when I was turned 15, almost 16. And, um, and I lived there. I had one little adventure off to California and then I came back to Hawaii. But I was living in Hawaii and I was surfing on the North Shore. And um, I nearly died uh, about a month before my 18th birthday <clears throat> and um, from the cyanide and strychnine poisoning. Some things I was eating had, had that in it. And uh, I was kind of living off the land at the time and was not conscious of health kind of things. And I almost died. In the, and in the recovery of that, I was unconscious for three and a half days at one point. And luckily, a lady found me in my tent, or I might not be here, and took me to clean up my tent and got some fluids in me and took me to a health food store. And uh, at the health food store, I was told to take a yoga class to help me. And I ended up going to this yoga class for a special guest speaker named Paul Bragg. And this man, one night in a speech, uh, inspired me to believe that maybe I could overcome my learning problems and someday learn how to be intelligent. And I, my life changed. That was when I, that night is the night I decided that I wanted to overcome my learning problems, somehow become intelligent and uh, go back and try to learn how to read because I was I had learning problems. I, I couldn't read. I didn't read till I was 18. And then um, I was on a pursuit to want to learn. And then I eventually left Hawaii, uh, flew to Los Angeles, hitchhiked back to Texas, and took a GED, which is a high school equivalency test, and passed. And then found my way doing what I could to get into college. And then I started to, I failed at first, but then I, with the help of my mom, I started reading dictionaries and memorizing words and growing my vocabulary. And as a result of that, I eventually learned how to read and then I never stopped. I just didn't want to stop reading. I just wanted to learn how to read. And I started reading, 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 reading. I mean, 18 hours a day. 
and more, 20 hours a day sometimes. And I eventually passed school and went on and excelled and became kind of a scholar. And, and I started teaching whatever I was learning. And it grew from community to city to city to state to nation to world. And I just never stopped the dream that I wanted to be a teacher and travel the world. Amazing. And when you were at college and around your peers, what were you like in, in your in your groups? Did you, did you have well, a peer group? Or? Uh, not really. A few, but when I was at uh, the first junior college, um, I would I was sort of reclusive, and I would just read and stay in the library most of the time. And slowly but surely, I would sometimes meditate outside in the sun and read in this, you know, in a yoga position, just read. And people would gather around and ask questions about me because I was different. Mm. I, I had long hair and everybody else was uh, different. I, I just stood out, I guess. And they would gather around and ask me questions. And I would, students would gather that way. When I'd go in the library, they'd gather around and ask questions. And I started teaching. And when I went on to the University of Houston, um, I would do yoga out under the trees in the park area. And they would gather around and start asking questions. I'd have 100 50, 125, 150, 100, sometimes 400 people would be gathered around each day. And um, whatever I was reading and stuff, we'd have discussions on. And sometimes if it rained, we'd be in the cafeteria and they'd come in the cafeteria. I had hundreds of people coming. And then when I went on to professional school, I started teaching every night. So I would get up at two in the morning, I would do yoga. I would um, read and speed read four to seven books on average and then go for a run and come back and shower, and then um, go to school, take classes, go to clinic, and in the clinic, after clinic at seven o'clock, I'd go and teach at my apartment. And I'd have 15, 20 students. Uh, they were paying me $20 per session, and I was giving classes every night on whatever I read in the morning. So I would read, and then I would give presentations on it. And that way, it kept me growing and learning. And um, I paid my way through school. I was probably the only student that was making over $100,000 teaching every night in my apartment. And then uh, that started opening up doorways to speak in little health food stores and little, you know, junior college areas and different groups and family homes. And it just started growing. And then when I graduated, I, I opened up my clinic and I started doing classes every night at my clinic. And that grew, and then I had my own, eventually got my own radio show and TV show and um, started doing larger programs. And then my practice grew so fast that a conference asked me to come in and share how I did it because I, I grew tenfold in 18 months. And they, um, so they started speaking on conferences in six locations, six times a year around America, where there'd be three to 8,000 people. And then that opened up doorways in other countries, and it just kept growing. And now I'm, uh, this year will be uh, in Sri Lanka. In a couple of weeks, I'll be the 155th country I've gotten to speak in now. Amazing. And so I, my dream was to go to every country in the world and speak. And so I still got about 50 something countries to go. So I'm still work on them. Which is the one country you, you really want to go to that you haven't Well, been to? I mean, anywhere I haven't been, I'm interested in going. So I'm, there's places in Africa, Northern Africa, there's places in the Middle East, there's places in. Uh, some northern Asian areas that I still haven't been to. You said you, you were speed reading four to seven books in the morning. Yeah. How, how did you develop that skill and how are you retaining the information? Well, um, because I had learning problems as a child, I guess when other students were going to school and they took school for granted, I really wanted to learn. And so I asked myself every day what worked and what didn't work to learn. And I started charting the things that seemed to work and the things that didn't work. And I started excelling in that. And I started to practice uh, long distance reading. I'd have a kid across the hallway, maybe 10, 12 feet. Um, and he would turn pages and I would snapshot pages and practice photo reading and, and speed reading and anything I could do to try to accelerate the learning process I was doing. And I got, you know, more proficient in it as I went. And then people started asking me, you know, how do I do it? And I started teaching speed learning programs. And occasionally I still do that today. But, um, you know, I, I, the, the most voluminous reading I ever did was uh, 11,000 pages in a day. So I, I knocked out 11,000 pages speed reading over 40 books in a day. 
And I, was, I just wanted to see what I could do, just out of curiosity. So I did that. I started early in the morning, and I kept working all day. And um, because I also had a deadline. I had to speak at a very prestigious oncology conference, and the leading oncologists in the world were there, and I was going to present my theory of cancer at the time. And I wanted to make sure I didn't make a fool of myself. I wanted to make sure I did. So I read every book that was available that I could get a hold of in Houston, Texas on cancer before I presented it. And so I had a deadline to knock out every book. So I was reading enormous amounts of books uh, on the topic. And then I realized I could do it. And then I, I linked whatever I was reading to what was most important to me, which is the evolu evolution of human consciousness, mm. uh, you know, how to expand your awareness and potential, and how to do something inspiring in your life. And so I, I had a mission to do that. And I also linked it to a conical diagram, which is the most universal symbolism. And I linked information to that and took my notes and organized it in such a way that I compiled about 350,000 pages of material of notes that I had piled together. I did it. I was neurotically reading and note taking. And um, so I did whatever I could to increase. I found out the faster I gave it to somebody. So if I read it and then I gave it that day, I retained it. So the faster I would get between in input and output, the more I retained. And if I had a purpose for doing it, did it. And then I had this opportunity to speak to a dental organization. I was studying TMJ and dentistry also, uh, besides the brain and neurology. And so I, um, I, I was presenting one day at a conference um, to about 400 dentists. And I didn't realize that I had information it wasn't even conscious, but a guy asked me a question and all of a sudden a photograph of Gray's Anatomy popped in my head and I could recite the entire page verbatim. I could see the whole thing. And I went, wow, I didn't know I knew that. But when I need that, it comes to the surface. Mm -hmm. So then I started speed reading even faster. I, I quit trying to limit my reading to the conscious level. I just let it go in and knowing that when I really needed it, it would be there. And I found that to be true. So what happens, I just allow it to let my eye see the materials. And then when somebody asks me a question, that information will come up when I need it. And I'll have access to it. And I, I quit limiting myself to the conscious reading um, limit because that really blocks, it's, I mean, that's a small component of what your reading capacities are. And then I, um, I just keep using it. I'm constantly, I, I do presentations, 76 courses in 299 different disciplines. So I'm using the material constantly to keep it fresh. And I'm constantly having researchers and myself bring in new information to keep it growing. So that keeps me learning. How do you keep yourself cognitively sharp throughout all of this? Um, I, know it's, I can't think of anything else I'd rather be doing. So mm. When you're doing something you love to do, you just you don't think about it. Yeah. I, I, mean, I, I eat. I don't live to eat. I eat to live. So I eat what is, allows me to maximally perform. And I do it every day. So, you know, if you use it every day, you don't lose it. Yeah. One thing I really liked what you spoke about there was um, when you had to, you, make the, you had to make the oncology deadline. And you said you were linking all of these books you were reading to, the, to your greater purpose. Yes. For people who are, if we use it specifically to a lot of the audience who are listening, who maybe wanted to get into better shape, uh, improve their mindset, improve how they feel, but they struggle to link what they're doing into how it's going to help them on a greater level. How do you, how do you, uh, we well, have to find that. out what you, every human being has a set of priorities, a set of values that they live their life by things that are most to least important in life. Whatever is highest on their value is the most intrinsic spontaneity value. And they will do it without having to think about it or any motivation. And finding what that is, uh, is first. And then linking the content of what you want to learn to that is amazing. I mean, I've seen children that had difficulties in school, and once we did that, amazingly what happened. So you asked how specifically is t studying and reading this content and this topic in this book, how is it specifically helping me fulfill what is truly most important to me? And the more links I make by answering that question, the higher the retention rate, the higher the attention rate, because we have a selective biased attention to things that are high in our values and we absorb information more quickly. So if I make that link and I keep making that link until I'm inspired to want to read that, it goes right in and it's available to use. 
And I found that that's a crucial component to accelerate the learning process. And how do people define the highest priority or value for themselves? Well, you look at how you fill your space because you find you, you, whatever is important to you, you keep close to you. So you look at how you fill your space most. What do you spend most of your time on? Because you make time, find time, and spend time on things that are valuable. You look at where you're energized because you're doing things high in your value, your energy goes up. You look at where you spend your money, things that aren't valuable, you don't want to put your money into. Where's your money going? You look at where you're most ordered and organized, where you're most disciplined spontaneity, with spontaneity. Uh, what do you think about, visualize, and internally dialogue about most that you want in your life that's showing evidence of coming true? What do you converse with other people about most commonly? What do you keep wanting to bring the conversations to? What inspires you and brings tears of inspiration to? And what's common to the people who inspire you? What are the persistent goals that you keep persisting on that is coming true? And what is it you spontaneously want to learn about, read about, learn about, listen to about, watch on videos? If you look at those, those are what I call the 13 value determinants. If you answer those three answers to each and look at what the answers are, you'll see a redundant reiteration of the same terms that'll keep showing up. And whatever showed up most frequent, second most and third most frequent are the top three values. And it's been a very valuable tool for thousands of people, from guidance counseling to businesses, you name it, using that tool. And I developed that tool a long time ago. And then it's a case of linking the, the activity you're doing to whatever that top one is. Understood. And what sort of links? Can you give an example of the links? Yeah, the link is very simple. How specifically is doing reading this material, mm. this topic, helping me fulfill what I my life demonstrates is most important to me? You know, my highest value is teaching. I do it every day. I mean, I, I've done already a consult this morning, a meeting this morning, and I got this meeting, I got another two radio shows, then I got a TV on London Real, then I have a podcast, another podcast, then a talk tonight. So that's my day. So if I look at what my day it, it consists of, it's teach, teaching. And then in the morning, I'm off to uh, Ireland, I do the same thing there. And I do that I, wherever I go, day by day, that's what I do. So I'm constantly using every possible vehicle to share information. And what happens to people who aren't living by their truest and highest values? What are the symptoms? Well, many times they are, and they're not honoring it because they're subordinating and trying to conform to other people and subordinate to other people and expect it to be something that it's not and then beat themselves up and not appreciate what they're actually doing. So sometimes it's that. Sometimes people are attempting to live... Um, outside their values, but you can't sustain that. Eventually you, you get pulled back into what's really valuable to you. So, but people aren't appreciating it. Many people have fantasies also about what's important to their life. You know, some people, if I ask a room of 10,000 people, how many of you are wanting to be financially independent? Every hand will go up. Mm -hmm. But then when I look at what their life demonstrates, maybe 1% or less of that room will demonstrate that they're buying assets that accumulate value and the rest of them will be living in the fantasy that financial independence is a lifestyle, so they're buying consumable depreciables, and they're going down in value instead of up in value, and they're never getting ahead financially. So many people confuse that they want financial independence, but what they really want is a lifestyle of the rich and famous spending money, which isn't going to give them financial independence. Mm -hmm. It's saving and investing money into things that go up in value, not spending money that makes financial independence. If you're not accumulating assets, it's not going to become independent. So many people don't know what they think what's important to them is important to them, but that's not actually what's important. And I find that in 90% of the people. They just don't know what's really important in their life. That's why I do the value determination process to help them discern that and then to structure their life around what is important. And does that uh, also play a part in relationships, whether it's uh, your spouse, your family, your colleagues? Is there, is there a case for alignment in values or should they be complementary? Well, there's no way you're going to find somebody that's the same values because hmm. they're unique. And if you found somebody that was exactly like you, you'd want to kill them eventually. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine being married. It'd be like the twilight zone, married to you, you know, married to yourself. So you find somebody that has similarities and differences. The ancient Greeks said if you have more similarities and differences, you are infatuated. If you see more differences and similarities, you're resentful. But if you have a blend of similarities and differences, you have love. So when you're infatuated with somebody, you go, oh my God, we have the same number of eyes, same number of teeth, the same number of ribs, same number of uh, you know, arms and legs, and we go, oh, we must be soulmates. 
That means they're focusing on what their similarities, and that's usually an infatuation. When they're resentful, they go, you know, we don't have anything in common, we're going in two different directions, we don't see eye to eye, and they're focusing on the differences. If they can see that there's differences and similarities, there's support and challenge, and you need both support and challenge to grow, and that's where the maximum appreciation and love really exists. That's where respect is. So you don't want somebody that's exactly like you, but you don't want somebody the other way. Otherwise, that'd be boring. And if it's too far away from you, it's burnout. But if you get the balance of the support and challenge, you got love. Is there a linking system that, that's useful between the two? Yes. If I, if I find out that I'm starting to see more differences and similarities in somebody, the thing to do is to go and ask how specifically what they're dedicated to, their highest value, how is it helping me fulfill what I'm dedicated to, my highest value. And if you make the links, you can reestablish great intimacy because you're starting to see the, how each are helping each other. And then you can ask how specifically what you're dedicated to is helping them fulfill what they're dedicated to. The more links you make, the more communion you'll have in the relationship. Amazing. I think uh, the, the linking system or the exercise is something a lot of people listening can take a, a lot from. Um, and, one, and a lot of the listeners who will be listening will also be questioning why they struggle with potentially weight gain, with potentially uh, why they've never been able to keep weight off in the long term. What have you seen in your in your travels to be big causes for this? Well, obviously we're eating more than yeah, your metabolism. Yeah, uh, But there's a motive there. I've never seen weight gain without a motive. It's always strategic. That offends people when they hear that, but it's true. Um, if you ask an individual, what's the benefit of eating more than you need and keeping weight on? They'll say at first, well, there isn't. I'm trying to lose weight. It's, it's, it's causing problems. It's causing health problems. I said, I didn't ask that. I said, what is the benefit you're getting out of it? Because until they get in touch with the unconscious motives and strategies that they're using and keeping weight on with, they're not going to make a difference. So I asked him, what's the benefit? Let me give you an example. I was doing a reality TV show at Universal Studios a number of years back. And there was a, I had 12 people to change a life. I had two hours to change. I had 24 hours to change 12 people's lives, two hours each. Okay. And they filmed the entire thing. Yeah. It's quite an intriguing little reality show. And um, there's a lady there that walked in with two boxes of groceries and food and came in and said, well, I figured everybody wants some food, so I brought everybody some food. Um, and then turned around and ate the entire two boxes. It was unbelievable. She ate more than I would eat in a week in one setting. It was unbelievable. And she was very large and very obese. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. So they asked me to uh, deal with her obesity. That was the question. And so I asked her, so what, what uh, is the benefit you're getting out of eating? She said, there's no benefit. That's why I want your help. I said, I know. But what is the benefit you're getting? Because no one will continue to do something unless there's more advantage and disadvantage. Because every decision a person makes is based on what's got more advantage and disadvantage. So if you're deciding to eat, you're in, inside you, consciously or unconsciously, perceiving more advantage and disadvantages. So what you tell me, I'm not interested in. What your life is demonstrating, I'm interested in. So what's the benefit so we can bring unconscious information conscious? And finally, she agreed to dig. And she said, well, finally, she said, well, everybody in my family is large. And I don't feel like I'm part of my family unless I'm big. I went, okay, good. That's one. What's another benefit of getting out of it? Well, I have a sister two years older than me. And she used to just bully me around and push me around. And I realized I was never going to be smaller than her. I always made sure I was bigger than her so she could push me around. And my whole family is large and she's large and I've never gone smaller than her because that way she can't push me around. I said, okay, there's two motives now. What's the third motive? Then all of a sudden she got teary eyed and she said, hmm. One time I went on a crash diet and I lost a lot of weight. And I started to have a bit of a shape because she was really big. I started to have a bit of a shape. It's the first time in my life that I really had some degree of a shape because I was really obese. And a guy hit on me and came on to me. And I thought it was love. I had no experience because I'd never been with a guy. And when he showed affection to me, I was vulnerable. And the very first night we were together, I made love with him. I had my first love experience. And the next day, he was gone and never to be seen again. And about six, seven weeks later, I found out I was pregnant. And then 
because of my Catholic upbringing, I was now forced for the fair paradox. If I have an abortion, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not great. But if I have a baby out of wedlock with a guy I don't want, that's not great either. And I couldn't make a decision. It was the most torturing thing in my life. I finally made a decision that I was going to have to abort the baby. And I felt guilty ever since. So I associated losing weight with that most painful thing in my life. And I swore I would never want to go through that again. So I've been unconsciously avoiding losing weight because it associated with that the most painful period of my life. So she said, I really keep the weight on to prevent and present, prevent me from being vulnerable to guys that might do that again. And she cried. I said, now we're getting somewhere. You have a motive each time to keep your weight on. And if you start to lose weight, you'll go and do something. You'll slow your metabolism and your thyroid function to make sure your metabolism slows down so you don't lose weight. Or you'll eat more to gain weight. So you'll either go and eat weight or you'll slow your metabolism down to make sure you don't lose weight. And she goes, yeah. And we did this. We kept looking at the benefits. Then we found out that she's in the TV industry. And from the, from the breast up, if she sits the way she does in her chair, you can see from the breast up on the TV. And her face is smooth and she's got a nice breast and she looks good on TV. And the rest of it below that is this giant woman. But you can't really tell it because she puts scarves and everything else. You don't know how big she is, but she's in front of TV. And she said, and if I lose weight, my skin sags and my, my, my skin sags. So I, I like everybody compliments me about my skin is so smooth because I keep eating and stretching the skin. And she said, so I, I, I like my skin you know, smooth. And so if I lose weight, I can see it start to sag. And I don't like that. So I make sure I keep eating. I said, can you see there's multiple reasons why you're keeping weight on? She goes, yeah. And we eventually kept doing this until we had 75 benefits. Wow. And then she realized, I said, until we can come up with the unconscious motives for doing it and then come up with alternative ways of getting the same benefit that eating is providing, the probability of you eating is very high. So we have to go in and find out how to get those same benefits. How can we now be part of the family without having to be big? Are there other things we can do that en engages in the family without having to be big and eating? And she said, yeah, there are different things we can do that I don't have to be eating with them. And, and then I said, what, how else can you interact with your sister and not be pushed around? She said, well, she's probably not really going to do that now that I think about it today. But when we were young, that, that happened, but not today. She, we're, we don't even live around each other. So that's an irrational motive there. And so what could you do that would make you close and connected where she didn't have to push you around? Just not challenge her values because then she'll put me down. I said, and then you're going to feel unfulfilled. Then you're going to want to eat to feel fulfilled again. Because when you're unfulfilled and not living by your highest values, you want to fill yourself full to compensate with your amygdala, which is the desire center and the consumption center. So it's very important to, to live by highest priority actions every day to keep your executive center calming down the amygdala's need for food. And that helps a lot. So prioritizing your life. So we organized uh, alternative ways of getting the values that she had. And then we helped her prioritize her life. And no, she didn't lose vast amounts of weight, but it definitely came down. I think she lost about 80 pounds, which is a lot, but not for what she had. Yeah. You know, but it was noticeable. But she did have to go and get some a surgical procedure on the back of her arms and a little bit on the back of her legs to tighten up the skin because she did lose some weight. Does this apply to eating disorders, all sorts of problems that are related around food as well? Yeah, there's, there's a motive for eating. And uh, the, usually the amygdala is the desire center. And you've got two hormones that regulate that, leptin and ghrelin. And these compounds are, when you distend the stomach, one hormone comes in. When you shrink the stomach, the other hormone comes in. And they affect the hypothalamus through a feedback loop. But when you're in your highest values and your objective, those systems usually have homeostasis and keep you from overeating or undereating. But if you're, in your, if you're not in your highest values and you're down into the lower brain system uh, and living by lower values, uh, the survival mechanism creates what is called false positive distortions in perception. And you'll distort your, what you think you need and you'll actually skew and overeat or undereat and go to extremes from anorexia to bulimic systems. So a lot of disorders are basically because we're not living by high values and we're down in the amygdala and it's a survival response. An animal in the wild 
uh, living in a food chain has a predator, natural predator, and natural prey that it eats and is getting eaten by. So when it's out there in the camouflage world, it's got to be on the lookout for the prey, predator and the prey. So it has to err on what's called a false positive. A false positive is assuming something's there when it's not. And if it doesn't assume that, and it assumes that it's not there when it is, a predator can eat it and they can die. And if it assumes it's not there when it is, a prey can get away from it. So it has to assume that it's actually there when it's not to be on the alert mechanism to do it. So those, those skewed subjective biases that occur from a false positive and a false negative distort what's going on in the brain and cause the feedback loops to be altered and they lead to extremes of overeating or undereating as a response and back and forth based on a response. So when we're living by our highest values and we're more objective, those things come into balance. If we're living by lower values and we're not doing what's really meaningful to us and we're not inspired and we see things interfering with our life and we're feeling unfulfilled, those go into extremes and we tend to want to go overeating to compensate. Interesting. And then that applies, I'm assuming, to all escapist mechanisms, whether it's drink, drugs, anything. Coffee, tea, anything that when you're engaged at work and you're so focused on what you're doing and you're absolutely loving it, you don't even want to take a break. Mm. If you want to eat, you quickly go get some food and come in and keep working. But when you're not engaged, you're wanting to, you're looking at the clock every hour and you're wanting to get out of there and you're wanting to get, you know, coffee, tea, stimulants, sugar, etc. And, and or porn or something, anything that gives a dopamine response, right? And those are compensations for disengagement and unfulfillment because they're not fulfilling what's highest on your value. If you can take your job description and link what you're doing it to your highest value and ask, how is it helping you? You'll find yourself eating more moderately. You'll find yourself not to, you know, drinking as much. You'll find yourself not distracted as much because the executive center calms down with glutamate and GABA. It calms down the impulses and instincts of the lower brain systems, where it's where you are avoiding and seeking. Where you, because if you have a predator, you're gonna you're gonna starve and you're gonna be emaciated. If you got prey, you're gonna get gluttonous and fat. And so those two things are calmed down when you're living by high priorities and you're more governed. How do people cultivate the, the level of self-awareness to be able to understand this if, if they're not already exposed to these ideas? Well, there's educational programs like yeah. mine. and The Breakthrough Experience is where I educate people on that. And my Prophecy One Experience is where I educate people on that. So it's just education. You know, if you're ignorant, you're more vulnerable to uh, impulsive and instinctual behaviors, animal behaviors. The more educated you are, the more aware, true education, not just information, but mm. truly valuable information, um, the more you're governed. When you're doing something that you really love to do, and you're, is that which is where you want to learn, and you're learning high priority things that inspire you, that make a difference in the world, you can govern yourself amazingly. I've had people that have been addicts and we found out what, what their subdictions are, the things they're trying to avoid in life and their addictions. And we neutralize them uh, by asking questions that bring a balance to perception. And then we get them onto priority. And sometimes getting them onto priority already calms down some of the behavior. Have you noticed uh, psychosomatic responses in these in these situations every time you have a skewed perspective and you see more sympathetic response or something challenges you get a sympathetic response mm-hmm. or something supports you get a parasympathetic response the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems when they come online because of these perceptions induce through neurotransmitters and neuromessengers and regulators they induce epigenetic alterations in the genes and histones and some of the cascading enzymes around the cell and the nucleus and they cr- print different proteins, which then affect enzyme function and also structural function. And yeah, you can create psychosomatic illnesses by altering perceptions. And if you have a skewed perception, there is no such thing as a skewed perception without a physiological response. You cannot have a distorted reality with your perceptions without having physiological change. Have you seen specific types where, whereby, for example, you may get pain in your knee, on your left knee, because something's happening in your family. Are, they, are these sorts of links evident? Yes. Uh, I compiled over 40-something years a list of those things. And it's about 1,000 pages. It's about 1,000 different types of conditions and ratios of perceptions. And yes, there's no doubt there's correlations repeatedly patterned in people. We had one yesterday in the Break 2 experience. It was just a, a classic one. But usually, for instance, the knees, uh, besides obvious injuries that you have to rule out, 
when you have a difficulty bending the knees, it can be related to giving into authority. Mm. And if you're having difficulty standing up straight, because the knee hurts when you straighten the leg, it can be standing up to authority. So you can have difficulty giving in or standing up to authority. And it could be difficulty putting your foot down or difficulty uh, taking your foot off. So each response physiologically has, has a psychology to it. Just like you have the facial muscles, the muscles of facial expression showing emotions, all of your muscles are showing emotions. They're all showing something. If you have difficulty grasping something, it could be pain holding that your hand closed, difficulty letting go of things, difficulty bringing things to you and receiving, difficulty giving things away. Each joint and each collection of muscles that do certain activities are correlated with different emotions. So there's a strong sense, a uh, strong link between you know, the common one of if you're stressed, your, your traps and your, your neck tighten up. Well, there's a stressed response that uh, Frank Nitter wrote about. Uh, Frank Nitter was an illustrator for the SIBA edition of Medical Illustrated Textbooks. And he, oh, let's see if I can pull him up here. He outlined the most common responses to stress. This stress response, so that would be Frank, pardon me for typing this as you're listening on this podcast, Frank Netter, stress. And this is the response here. So he took all the neurochemistry and neurotransmitters and everything else in the autonomic response to stress. And you'll see that the jaw tightens up, certain muscles contract, you know, forehead, brow, everything. There's a certain response that goes on, a certain thing for the stress response under fight or flight that's predictable. And so you can, you can see that over time, the chronic application of that. And yes, there, is a, there are psychosomatic correlations that I think are very straightforward. Alexander Lowen, Ken Dykwald, uh, Freud, many of them have been over the years uh, outlined. I spent many, many years and many hours putting those together and writing a textbook on those correlations. And I present that about, I'm doing that this year in Australia, but I do it every year in some country. Amazing. Uh, from shifting from a from a client point of view to a coach's point of view, when when you're dealing with other coaches and you're 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 coaching them on how to improve their practice, how do you tackle the subject of mental resilience in dealing with different uh, problems, or obstacles that their clients are facing, and and being able to stay resilient through through their challenges? Well, once you understand what resilience is, it's really not that difficult. Um, because everybody has a set of priorities that they live their life by, whenever they're doing things that are higher in their priorities, they are more self-worth oriented. They grow their self-worth. Because when you do high priorities, your self-worth goes up. When you do low priority things, your self-worth goes down. Everybody who knows when they do the highest priority things and they got everything done that they set out for the day, they feel greater. And anytime they feel that they didn't get around to doing the most important things, they got distracted, they feel lesser. Also, when they're living by their highest values, the blood glucose and oxygen goes into the forebrain and creates the executive function, where you're more objective and able to see both sides of things. When you're living in the lower priorities, you get your amygdala going on. The blood glucose goes to the amygdala. The amygdala is the desire center. It wants to avoid pain and seek pleasure. It goes into survival and creates skewed views, biases, and um, the false positives and false negatives, as I was saying. So the moment you are... Uh, in a bias situation where you're highly infatuated for prey to get it or highly resentful to predator to avoid it, uh, anything that's a highly pleasurable, you fear its loss. Anything that's highly uh, painful, you fear its gain. So every time you go into the lower systems by living by lower values, you're increasing the probability of phobia, fear of gain of that which you, fear of gain of that which you're trying to avoid and fear of loss of that which you're trying to, to seek. But when you go back up in the executive center, the highest areas, you're more neutral. Objectivity means neutrality, non-bias. And when you're neutral, the fear of loss of something goes down. The fear of gain of something goes down. And so now you're adaptable and resilient. Resilience is the ability to adapt to a changing environment. And it's the ability to uh, respond in micro movements to changes that are going on before it cataclysmically requires abrupt cataclysmic change. So, but when you're highly polarized and highly biased and highly emotional, um, you have less resilience because you fear, again, that which you're seeking and you fear the, the loss of that which you're seeking, the fear of gain of that which you're trying to avoid. 
So if you live by highest priorities, your resilience factor goes up immediately. So just getting people to fill their day with high priority actions that inspire them, their day doesn't fill up with low priority distractions that don't, their resilience factor goes up. And it's a measurable factor that goes up and they can handle and adapt much more efficiently. So if you take it from a coaching scenario, if coaches... Uh, and keep them focused on the highest priority. Yeah. Now, this is where determining the values comes in. Many people have fantasies about what's valuable to them. Mm. And so you got to find out what's truly valuable to them, what their life demonstrates, not their ideologies and fantasies that they think it should be. Once those are clear, it, getting a resilience out of them is very easy. So essentially, a lot of coaches who struggle with resilience aren't actually living by true value of coaching. There may not be that true value. Well, or they're doing things in the coaching that they would be wise to delegate. Okay. See, I, if I say that I'm a, a, you know, a teacher, I love the teaching part. I don't like the administrative part. I don't like the business part. That's not, I did at one time, but I delegated that 30 something years ago, 40 years now. So I haven't done that in 40 years almost. I delegate anything that I'm not inspired by. You can't live an inspired life doing things that don't inspire you. So you have two choices, either go and delegate things so you can go do what you love or link what you're doing to what's highest on your value so you're not drained by it. So what I do is I basically research, write, travel, teach. Everything else is delegated. I haven't driven a car in 31 years. I haven't, you know, wow. I, I, I don't cook. I don't, I, I, I get to a, an airport. Uh, I, I have a limo that picks me up from a hotel. It takes me to the airport. I get in, I get on the thing, I get out, I get on that limo, I go to the, the next hotel. I don't do anything. It's all done. So I walk up, there's a sign for me. I get in, I get my computer up. I do work and research and write articles while I'm driving. They're, they're driving. And then I get to the hotel and I have an agenda. I get a, an agenda every day. It's, it's, there's always an agenda for me every day waiting for me. So I, I just, and, they, and I've given everybody who organized my agenda my priorities. So they know that I, if I have a priority to do a keynote speech to thousands of people, that takes precedence. If I have a, a TV show of a couple hundred million people, then that's precedent. I've got everything that I do for teaching all laid out in a priority. They know that. It's sitting there in front of them, and their job is to fill things up according to priority and reset things according to priority and have that in front of me every day. And I may be getting three of those in a day because there may be two things that come in. This morning, two more things have been added already to today. So that's that. That's, so I don't do anything except... Follow the highest priority actions I can do to teach the most number of people. Amazing. I'm going to ask then, what is your greatest fear? I don't know. It used to be many things. It was more of a, it, you know, people ask me if I have a fear of speaking. I said, no, I have a fear of not speaking probably. <laughs> if not fulfilling my, my, um, my mission would probably be it, but I do it every day. So I don't have that anxiety. Um, Probably the, the, the biggest challenges I face that might bring up a fear would be if there's delays on flights and I have um, a big audience waiting for me somewhere and I'm not going to get there until delay and, and having to put the promoter and the audience through delays. I don't like that. And, it's a, and sometimes I'll get, if I, they say, well, we're going to be delayed for 45 minutes, I'm going, oh, great. I just missed my, my connection or something. And I have to sit down and do my own Demartini method on that, neutralize that sometime to think, okay, how are we going to do it? Or do I need a private jet? I, I had a situation where I was in Melbourne, Australia last year, and I was supposed to speak in Serbia the next day. And I got to check in in Melbourne, and they said, well, we've, um, we've got a bit of a, a challenge. And I, and I said, what's that? So, well, I can't take your bags you're going from here to Qatar, Qatar to Milan, and Milan to Serbia. And when you get to Milan, Serbian Airlines does not work with the, the alliance that we're in. You know, there's like the Star Alliance thing. And so we can't put your bags through. And you'll have to pick up your bags and why. So, well, I have a 45-minute delay between my flight and that flight. And there's no way I can do that. Because if I have to go down and get my bags and then go to another terminal and get in, I can't check in in time. So is there anything you can do about it? I said, well, nothing we can do about it. And so I asked for the supervisor. And they said, well, there's nothing we can do about it. And luckily, there was a guy who was with the bags said, sir, I, I might be able to help you. And I said, what's that? He says, there's a service we can call. And I said, really? He says, I'll take care of it. I'll see what I can do. Can't guarantee it, but if, if they're available, I'll do it. 
you're going to have to go. So what I'll do is I'll notify you by email, but when you get to Qatar, go online and I'll tell you the status of it. So I, um, I go there and I'm a little anxious about uh, whether or not I'm going to get there because if I get there and I can't get to my speech, I got thousands of people waiting for me, right? And they're, they're going to be mad because I'm stuck. And, and I, I've already notified my staff, not ever put me in this situation again, make sure that these things go through. Otherwise, let's get a private jet. And um, we were looking at private jet alternatives. So I sent off emails when, before I got on the plane that day to, to make sure we got backups when I get to Milan. If I have to do a private jet, we'll just do a private jet. So we went and we found a, this guy located a service. So when I finally land in Milan, I asked if I could be the first person off, which they allowed me to do. Anyway, I was up in the front. And uh, when I did, the door opens, and there was a lady there with a sign. And instead of going down the ramp, we went down the steps, got in a car, went over to another uh, thing, went up, and there was somebody there with the passport thing taken care of. They grabbed my bags, they took care of it, everything else, and got on the plane, and we, we made the flight. And uh, so we had a service there. But I didn't know until I got that door open, whether that was going to be there and whether I was going to do that or I was going to have to do the, the um, go inside, open up my, my web and see if the, there's a, am I doing a flight of jet or what, what am I doing? So there's a little bit of an, a stress level and uh, anxiety there until you know. So that was, that was some of those things. So I have those kind of things. But that's about it. Fear of not delivering, not being able to deliver your mission. Not being able to deliver, it, well, it, if, if, they, if there was not thousands of people sitting there and there was not a promoter that's dependent on that, that's a risk for them. And I'd rather not them be put in that situation and just because of a flight issue. So I'd rather have backup systems. And sometimes I, I was in uh, speaking at the Academy of Sciences in Austria and I had to speak and do the breakthrough experience in London the next morning. So I speak until 10.30 in the Academy of Science in Austria. And I have an 8 o'clock start in... Uh, in London the next morning. And so we had to get a private jet from Austria to do it. And I got a private jet and I landed. I got in at, I think at two in the morning and um, got to the hotel around 3.15 and went to bed and got up. And um, I did, I'd lived on four hours sleep for 35 years anyway, so it wasn't a big deal. But I, I made the program and everything else, but I had to do a private jet. There's no way commercial jets would have gotten me there. Would you say living by your values and priorities is the key to high performance in the long term? Absolutely. In across all fields? Without a doubt. When you see people that are inspired by what they do and they're living congruently, they definitely excel. Yeah. There's no doubt in my mind on that now. I'm, I'm, I've been studying that for a long time. I'm absolutely certain about that. Well, what, is your, what is your goal to leave this place? When you leave this place, what do you want your legacy to be? Well, I, have, I want to fulfill all the things in my book I have a gold book. Let's see where it is. Here it is. Um, I have a gold book that, uh, there's 25 of these now. Wow. So this has got all the objectives. This is all written by you. All written by me. So I keep record of all, I have the gold written out and I keep record of it. So if I, for instance, want to, uh, every I, I set a goal to go to every major country. So every country I document where I've been, every major city, 2,039 cities now. And, um, you know, everything I document, keep records of it. So I'm constantly doing it. Every country, company that I consult for, I keep records of it. So there's 3,000 com companies that I've, I've worked for and, and done work with. Um, every celebrity, for instance, that I've interacted with, I keep records of all the celebrities that I work with, even to, even to good old Donald. And uh, so I keep records of everybody that I'm working with. For those of you who can't see what John's doing, he's, uh, he's got a thousand page plus binder in front of me. Yeah, that's one of 25 uh, the yeah. volumes. This is wow. volume one. Wow. It's called The State of My Mission Book. I research, I write, I travel, I teach. And it's basically got every goal that I have, all the intentions, um, but everything is metric. So I have a goal to do something and then I keep records of it. And also my homes around the world, everything is, is mapped out in each area socially, what I intend to accomplish, all the movies that I've gotten to do, all the supermodels I've gotten to work with. I, I mean, I keep record of everything. I'm relentless on it. 
do you journal this in a, in a book and then have it typed up later on? No, I type this up every single night. Oh, every night, okay. Every night. And then I keep records of it. And for instance, that is volume one. This is a portion of volume 23. And so I, oh, this is also my gratitude journal. So I keep records of everything. Like this is a French a new movie that's being made that we got involved in. So we got one with Stephen Hawking coming up. And then uh, I keep record of everything. Even uh, I had a goal to uh, surf on my 65th birthday. I don't know if I, you knew that, but I didn't know. Yeah, I wanted to go surfing on my 65th birthday. So in Hawaii on the North Shore, because I used to surf there. So that's me surfing on my 65th birthday two months ago in Hawaii. Amazing. Full circle. Yeah. So I, it was just a goal. I, when I was 16, I, I made a commitment that I would surf big waves on my 65th because I saw a guy do that. So I, there's a 49-year goal that was accomplished finally. So I keep records of that. So every, everything that I set out to do, I metric it. Because if you're, if you're serious about it, you'll keep metrics on it. If that makes sense. And so I'm a, I'm a metric guy. Can you give an example of setting a, a, a goal? And how you go, what the goal setting process is? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have a, there's thousands of them. <laughs> Pick one out of there. Uh, if I, Take, um, how often do you bring, how often do you print this out? Well, this is edited every day. Yeah. In fact, uh, I don't know if your podcast is in it yet today because we're just now doing it. Let me see here. I my consult with the gentleman prior to it who is the last one entry. So, oh wow, so it's, everything is yeah, so pretty much a live document. It's a live document. So I consulted last night till 2 a.m. Uh, doing work. And uh, then uh, this morning now I'm doing the things. So I document as I go daily, every day. So everything I get to do and I keep metrics. So if I do podcast, you know, what podcasts, radio, television. I do London Real today, the movie, the, the show or whatever. So I keep records of everything and it's all documented. But I, uh, I'll just let you read. I mean, if you want to see it here. But here's some samples. I basically believe in some sort of intelligence of the universe that I'm participating in. But I write down exactly what I intend to do. Can I read out? Do you want me to read one or something? Yeah, I can read one out. Uh, so it says here that I ask that I, uh, that from my many decades of interdisciplinary research, I'd be able to compose a great and respected series of inspired syncretic writings. I ask that these writings be able to expunge any inconsistencies and contradictions found within many separate previous inquiries into every particular branch of knowledge composed by those other inquisitive individuals of every stage of conscious awareness of history. I ask that the wandering and independent life I naturally lead set me free in some measure from any form of strong attachments to popular and polarized opinions that could impede my potential insights, discoveries, and writings along my way. I ask to be a pioneering literary philosopher and scientist that discovers and reveals the underlying and universal mathematical laws behind many of nature's greatest secrets. So I have that as an objective. And that's what I am you know, pursuing every day. And uh, so here's another one. I ask that I be one of the great visionary thinkers that shapes human understanding and awakens slumbering human beings to the astounding interconnectedness of the universe across all scales and dimensions of life more profoundly than any other one polymathic thinker before. I ask that I be a pioneer in, of the notion that the natural world is but a living and loving web of integrally entwined elements, each in constant dynamic and entangled dialogue with each other. I ask that my legacy be not just this single discovery, but an array of original applications that I come to aspire with and express. I ask that I represent knowledge and living wisdom that, many, many, that my many-sidedness and integrative understanding allows me to respond intellectually from one point and angle to which I pursue or by which I am approached. I ask that I uh, be at home globally and be able to lavish upon the intellectual discoveries or treasures that I share throughout the world. I ask that I be like a fountain from which the refreshing and inexhaustible stream of inspired ideas are ever flowing. I ask that I demonstrate that a certain vastness of learning and a quasi-omnipresence of the human soul in nature is possible. 
and I ask that I inform and impress the greatest minds of my time and that I invariably influence the course of science and religion and their intercourse with the rest of culture in many ways innumerable, enduring and profound. And I ask that you be one of the most captivating and inspiring men of my time. I ask that my body, mind and soul be my instruments of inquiry into the natural, the nature of the world and beyond. So I have thousands of these entrants about how I envision my life. And then I keep documents about my applications and how well I'm doing what I'm intending. So your goal setting process is very much about the, the process of becoming rather than I want to achieve this, but it's, it's what you want to become. It's, it's what I'm being and living. Yeah, yeah, being it's what I, this is what I do. I ask that I may initiate the foundation of an institute of higher learning where nature, mature and wise individuals animated by intellectual and inspirational purposes can be left to their own ends in their own way. I ask that such a free society of scholars dedicated to the highest standards be governed by, by only other astute scholars and inspired scientists, not administrators or organizers, for the sake of originating the most ingenious and creative ideas that solve the greatest and most meaningful problems facing humanity. I ask that this institute provide an essential leisure time as necessary for birthing truly original ideas that serve. I ask that the gamut of topics and disciplines allowed to be originated and explored become endless. I ask that neither race or creed or sex or color be banned or ban any being from their application and contribution. And I ask that this institute be primary center for polymathic cross-disciplinary cross-fertilizing inquiries into the nature of being and human existence and progress. And I ask that many sub-schools of inquiry emerge over time, all of which remain free from strictly commercial intentions or restrictions. So these are very clear, concise objectives that I'm working on around the world. Amazing. And there's thousands of them. You've written at the start of each one, Dear God. What yeah, does I, that mean? I, well, what does that mean people ask me that all the time, yeah. and I define it in other sections. But there's one page here that um, I'll just read. Because <clears throat> what it really means is this. <clears throat> It, it, I call it the grand organized design, uh, a non-anthropomorphic, non-gendered, poly, pan-psychic intelligent energy and information of the universe, the natural law of the universe, the universal laws are giving rise to and governing this spirit of ecological matrix of life. So it's not so much some anthropomorphic deity that's made up by some tribal thinking that's being projected from human experiences. It's more of, of the natural laws that bring equanimity and equity to human experience and also perception, and it allows us to actually keep the, the evolution of consciousness evolving. And panpsychics were like Max Planck and Erwin Schrodinger and Sir Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein, back to Aristotle. Uh, Zeno was a panpsychic, Thales was a panpsychic. Some of the greatest minds, there's over, oh, maybe 1,600 of the famous philosophers that were panpsychics. I'm one of those people. So that's volume one. Volume one. Ooh, Twenty-five volumes. volumes. Twenty-five volumes. Are they all in order, or are they? Yeah, they're on my computer here. If I pull them up, and these they're... all kept personally to you, as as your your own personal journals. Yeah, these are my personal journals. Sometimes my students like to read them, but they usually. Let's see if I can find that. This has twenty-four. It's about to divide one into twenty-five. That's it's about to happen, like today or tomorrow, because it's when the files get too big. We have no choice but to do it. So there's volumes right there. So it's about this. This one right here is about to be split into because it's getting too big. And it, when the file gets too big with too many pictures, it, I, I have to cut it. It's usually around 600 to 1,000 pages. Wow. 25,000 pages of work there. Yeah. Across how, how long is that? Uh, well, that goes back all the way back to <clears throat> very young. I've been doing the, the, the dialogue journal things. This, this particular mission statement book, the mission statement that I just read from, or read underneath, uh, started, it says here, you can read it. It started, the first written edition was 1972, first typed edition, 73, the first computerized edition, 1982, and now we're in the 76th typed rendition, 2019. So I have, I'm about to, um, you know, I may update it again. Maybe I put in a word or change, change a phrase or whatever. But this is my mission statement itself, what I'm dedicated to in life. Amazing. Yeah. Is that, is that anywhere people can, people can read and see online? 
No. No, this is, this is delegate Just me. Yeah. You can take a peek at it if you want. And this is crystal clear, which is... It's me. Yeah. Crystal clear. For, for those of you who obviously can't see this, but uh, Dr. Martini's just showed me his mission statement, and it's just the page, which is outlines physically, spiritually, emotionally, uh, all the different parts, that domains of life that you want to strive towards. And yeah, I wanted to call all errors. I, I, I had a desire to create original ideas that are ingenious ideas to contribute to the humanity. I wanted to wake up my mind and, and genius. So I wanted to do create original ideas that served humanity. Um, even my uh, cufflinks that I wear says that in service to humanity. <laughs> and then I, I wanted to create a business that was international. In 2016, we finally have students in every country in the world. So that took a while. That, that started in 1982, so it took 34 years to get that achieved. And then we had a desire to be financially independent, which I'm easily taken care of there. So I'm financially free. I don't have to work, but I do. I want to have a global, I, I've said since I was 20 that the universe is my playground, the world is my home. Every country is a room in the house and every city is the platform I share my soul on. And um, that's been with me ever since 20. Where does he live? The universe is my playground, the world is my home. Every country and city is another room. So I've been saying that and now I live on the world, the ship called the world as you, you may or may not know, I don't know. But I, um, Let's see if I can show you a picture of this. So I've been living on here for 19 years. Really? Yeah. In fact, they just did an article in Australia on it today. It just came in today. Do you want to just describe to the listeners what, what exactly you showed me? Uh, well, where I live is a ship called the world. I've been living on there 19 years when I'm there. I'm, I'm, I'm it's, a, it's an actual ship as well, by the way. It's what? I'm just telling everyone it's an actual ship. It's not, yeah, a, it's not it's a metaphor. A ship. So they just mentioned it here where I'm uh, living on there, but they're talking about the world. So they're, so that's, that's actually my home right there. And um, they're doing a, a feature on it right now in the week, Weekend Australian newspaper. And they've referenced myself and some people like uh, Gina Reinhart, who's one of the wealthiest women in the world. Different people. So that's been my home for 19 years. Well, I, I guess I wanted to travel the world and I thought that's the best home because when I'm on there, it goes to every country from the Antarctic to the Arctic. So that way I can get to more countries. So I go to bed in Germany and wake up in Amsterdam or something, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and so I can, I don't lose time traveling that way. I can just, I can be resting and I'm in the next country that way. Yeah, where is it right now? Uh, it's actually headed towards uh, Turkey and, and the Mediterranean now. And then you'll, you'll catch up with it. I'll catch up in, a, in between places. So I, sometimes I'm on the other side of the world and then I don't see it. Um, it's actually, it's going to be in Australia. I just missed Australia with it, but it's going to end up eventually coming back into the Mediterranean. It comes all the way through the world, moves all over the place. And who's in there right now? Pardon me? Who, who's, who's living on there right now? Well, there's a hundred of us that live on there. It's a $2.4 billion ship divided by a hundred people and we all have condominiums on there. And then it circumnavigates the world and people are on and off it or whatever. And when I'm not there, sometimes I rent it out to, to the friends and things, but it's, it's, uh, it's just a floating condominium basically. Amazing. If you had any parting words to, to give to our listeners, what would they be? Uh, give yourself permission to uh, do something extraordinary on planet earth. It's your nature to make a difference. You have a unique path. Your highest value is the expression of it. If you prioritize your life every day and ask yourself, what is the highest priority action steps or action step I can do today that can serve the greatest amount of people in the most inspiring way with the resources you have most efficiently. If you ask that every single day, it's impossible not to do build momentum towards something pretty amazing. Amazing. Thanks so much for coming on Dr. D. Martini. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for being here today on this episode of RNT Fitness Radio. I'd love for you to do a quick little favor for us. Please head over to iTunes and give us a five-star rating, leave a comment, and share it with your family and friends. If you're interested in learning more about how to transform your body and positively change your life, go to www.rntfitness.com and explore all our free content on offer. 
Thank you.